was that God lost us. He lost fellowship with us. But when Jesus Christ died on that cross, when he said it was finished, when he rose on the third day, now anyone who would believe on him can come boldly into his throne room, can come in fellowship with him. How do I know what God is like? How do I know who God is? I look at Jesus Christ. man, I'm telling you. I want you to go over to Acts chapter 10, verse 38. As you're going there, I just want to kind of give you the plot if you've never watched this movie, movie before. Bruce Nolan is a television reporter who, growing increasingly dissatisfied with his existence, he curses God for making his life miserable. And I'll tell you, isn't that what so many people do? God, why did you do this? God, why am I like this? God, and I'm going to show you that it's not necessarily God that does these things. So this is what God does. God responds by bestowing all of his power on Bruce for a week to see how he can handle it. Bruce has this weird conception of God, like so many people do and like religion does. And, and he thought God was the one doing all this bad, and really he found out it wasn't God at all. So we're going to look at a little clip, and then we'll get right into this. God and so many people do and I truly believe it's what religion puts down people's into people's mind and we as a church need to renew our mind to what God's word says that God is amen and that's what I want to talk about today I want you to look at the scripture in Acts chapter 10 verse 38 <clears throat> let's begin right at the beginning because this has about three points I want you to see here how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power now watch this next part. You should underline this in your Bible. Ready? Who went about doing good. Everybody say, went about doing good. Doing good. And now it's going to tell us what good is. Are you ready? Healing. Look, who went about doing good and healing all. He went about doing good and doing what? So healing, I would say, is good. Would you agree with that? Now, where did this good come from? It just said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good. But yet I have heard and maybe many of you have heard is, well, God puts this on me. God put this on me to teach me something. God laid this sickness on me. God put this cancer. God took my child on and on and on and on. And God gets this bad rap. God, religion just throws this poop right on God when it has no justification from the word of God. Because right here in this scripture, I'm going to show you a little bit more today, but right here in this scripture, it says that Jesus went around doing what? Good. Healing who? Some, a few, chosen ones, special ones, those that are just, you know, okay with God, those that never sinned, those that never made a mistake. Well, really, when you think of that statement, with well, a woman with the issue of blood, she was sinning when she got healed because she wasn't supposed to be out there with an issue of blood. Keep going on. Who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. It doesn't say a person is possessed by the devil when sickness comes against them. What it's saying is sickness came at the fall. Sickness came into our world because of the fall. Jesus Christ came into the world. He did good. Good is healing. Say this to me. Healing is good. Sickness is bad. Real simple, right? But why is it the world, the world, the world, or even, and let me just be real nice today, religion kind of puts it a whole different way, doesn't it? Bruce didn't understand that God is a loving father. He saw him as someone who was looking out to get him, to smite him. Kind of like a sign that I see when I drive to work sometimes. And here's what this sign says. Be careful, God is watching you. And the insinuation of that is not, God is watching me to protect me, to love me, to watch over me, but God is watching you that if you make a mistake, he's going to smite you. You go ahead and blow it, he'll make sure lightning falls on top of you. Anybody know what I'm talking about today? 
The insinuation is that God is a meanie up in heaven and that this meanie up in heaven is looking for us to make one lousy mistake. Well, let me tell you something. I'd probably make a dozen a day. And he's still for me because the Bible says if God is for me, who can be against me? Then he starts naming the principality, power, things of this world, things yet to come. None of that can be against me when God is for me. Now, there's a couple of people in the Old Testament. Remember, we don't live under the Old Testament. We get the blessings of the Old Testament. According to Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, right? Being made a curse for us, that the blessings of Abraham may come upon us Gentiles. But there's a couple of people in the Old Testament that kind of stand out. And it's because of a statement that's made in the New Testament about them. The first person is, they, oh, let's, let's go, Abraham. Abraham, watch while we do that, right? That's not good. All right, let's go. Abraham was a friend of God, right? The second person is David. David was called what? A man after God's own heart. And watch how David writes this in Psalm 23, verse 6, about God watching over. It's a New Living Translation, so it'll be up on the screen there. Verse 6, surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me. Say that, will pursue me. Surely what? God's goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. So my attitude should not be God's looking for me to make a mistake. My attitude should be God's looking to bless me. God's look, he pursues me, hallelujah. The same way when I wanted to marry Diane, I pursued her. I went after her, I called her up. How you doing, Diane? Would you like to go out to White Castle today? Woohoo! Man, come on, anybody want to talk White Castle? You guys got to know White Castle are holy hamburgers. They got holes in them, right? Anyway, bad joke, okay. Anyway, God, the same way we pursue our mate or we pursue whatever it is in life, God is pursuing us. God is for us. People see God as a big meanie. But when we as his children, we should be showing them God's true nature, who God truly is. But religion has given us a warped picture of almighty God. I've shared too many times growing up what I was taught in church. It took Time for me to renew this mind. It took time for me to get my thinking straight. And the only way, let me say it again, the only way I could get my thinking straight was I had to see what the Bible says about God and I need to believe it. See, I can't, I can't be moved by what I see. I can't be moved by what I hear. I can't be moved by my senses. I have to be moved by what the word of God says. If the Bible says God is my father, then as a father, he is obligated to take a father's place in my life. And as a child, I am obligated to be his child. And it's a good thing, amen? Man, I, you know, my kids don't, my kids, you know, when they're living home, they, they're not, oh, please, can we have a piece of, of this from the fridge? They just went in the fridge and they enjoyed it. But we, ever hear some of our prayers? It'd be the most fascinating thing for you to do is to get a recorder and record your 10 minutes of prayer, 15 minutes of prayer. Oh God, if you can, do you want to? How about it? Oh, God, it, it, it's, it's total, it, it, in a sense, receive this in love, guys, because receive it as that we want to learn and grow. It's almost disrespectful to God. It'd be like my children coming up to me and saying, oh, dear daddy in this house, will thou, daddy, is please give us me a morsel of thy bread and a cup of thy water? That'll be the day those guys did it. There have been times I come home ready for that piece of chocolate cake or something, and it ain't there no more. And I go, where's the cake? Oh, you know, uh, Rebecca did it. Where? No, Daniel did it. Oh, where? Jen did it. Where's the cake? We ate it, Dad. And what are you going to do? You're a loving father. You're going to say, did you enjoy it? <laughs> As a loving father, think about it. I wish we could just, even as earthly as we are, we are earthly people, earthly fathers, earthly dads, we would do anything for our children. 
If our child needed a kidney and we had a kidney that match, our kidneys go into our child. Our child needs blood. We're there. We're there. We're, my dad, I remember my dad, I told you that last week, working 40, 50 hours at work, coming home, getting washed, going to work a night job just to provide for his family. Did he have to do it? No, he could have been a, a boozer. He could have sat home, whatever. But he was a loving father. How much more God? But then religion wants to tell us God is out to smite thee. Be careful. He's watching you. Make a mistake. I've made plenty, and he still loves me. How many here have made at least one mistake in your life? How many here have made a dozen before you got to church today? He's for us. He's not against us. But this religious thinking just warps it. I'm going to show you how Jesus dealt with it. Amen? Jesus is the true nature of God. He is all God. He is the perfect image of God. So when I want to know what God is like, all I need to do is go to Jesus. Watch this. Go over to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Philippians 2 and verse 5. God is good and all the time. In Philippians 2, 5, the Apostle Paul says this. Let this mind or thinking, and can I say this? If you struggle in your mind, you struggle with thoughts, thoughts kind of overwhelm you and stuff, you will never have victory until, until you start taking control of those thoughts. Listen, my mind used to be like an old-fashioned record player with a scratch on it. You get a thought and it just keeps going on and on. But as you read the Word of God and you think the Word of God and you apply the Word of God, watch and see, it will become less and less. You got to take the start. See, faith is the step. I believe God, therefore I'm going to take a step of faith on this. Do you understand what I'm saying? If my mind is constantly coming against me, you're no good. You're an idiot. Nobody likes you. Look at the way they look at you. They're laughing at you. Don't go to church. They're just going to make fun of you. And you just hear that constantly. What you got to do is fight it right back. Do you notice when Jesus Christ was, was tried by the devil? He didn't come up to him and say, oh, devil, leave me alone. I'm the son of God. Oh, devil, get out of here. What did he do every time? It is written. It is written, it is written. He quoted the word of God. That meant he must have had the word of God within him, Jesus. He got the word of God within him and then he spoke it out when the temptations, when the trials, when the tests come against him. We have to do the same thing. Temptation isn't just out here. Temptation starts, number one, in here. When that thought comes, that's when you got to resist the devil and he will flee from you. But if you just open your mind up and say, put it in. Listen, you come to my house. You dump garbage on my front porch. I see. I'm going to dump it right back at you. I don't want your garbage. Your garbage is your garbage. And I'm talking about literal garbage right now. If you came and said, I don't want to go to the dump today and dump it. I'm going to say, what, are you crazy? That's the way we should be with the devil. When he brings garbage to your mind, when he brings thoughts to you, thoughts of failure, thoughts of no good, thoughts of, oh, I'm having a pain, I might be having a heart attack, or things like that, fight him. It's an amazing thing that out of the armor of God, the only piece that is offensive is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Come on, you can talk in this church. Is the Word of God. No word in, no word out. If you don't take time to get the word in you, if you don't make it, man, you can come to a church like this, a church like Pastor Jim's church, get fed the word of God on Sunday. But if you're not doing anything the rest of the week, that word's not going to last you. It's not going to last you. Sorry to pop your bubble, but you know what? As my wife says, and you know the way she is with the word of God, you eat three good meals a day, you should eat at least three good meals of the word of God a day. It doesn't mean sit down for two hours and read. It means just pick up your Bible, get a little one, get them on your iPhone, your iPad, whatever, and read just a little bit of the Word of God constantly through the day and watch how your mind becomes a place of peace. What was that scripture? Isaiah, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. It'll keep us in perfect peace. I don't know about you, I've had strife, I have peace. I've had peace. Peace is better. 
I've been sick, I've been well. Well is better. I've been poor, I've been blessed. Blessed is better. Come on, are you with me, guys? Now, oh, I don't know. It might be God bringing it. It is not God bringing it to you. How do you know? Follow me today. Here we go. Philippians 2, 5, ready? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Say that, equal with God. So when they knock on your door and say, well, Jesus is God, but he's not a God like God Almighty, say, sorry, my Bible says he's equal with God. Amen. I don't have time to play games, guys. You're talking about eternity. See, the Bible says to be born again, you must believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. You must believe that he is almighty God. You must believe he died on that cross and he rose on the third day. Amen. Don't go putting all this, this uh, uh, poison in there. And no, no. But he made himself of no reputation. He took the form of a bondservant. He came in the likeness of a man. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Amen. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of beings in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, I want to give you that verse 6 in a couple translations. The first one is the Amplified. Watch. Who, although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which makes God God, he did not think this equality was with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained. Wow. I know it's a little wordy there. Here it is in the New Living Translation, a little easier to catch. What, ready? Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to be grasped. The Message Bible paraphrase says it like this. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantage of that status no matter what. So he's equal with God. But then I want you to catch this now. Is God flesh? No. Almighty God, Jesus said, is what? Is a spirit, right? John 4, 24. And, but we are flesh, right? Everybody say, look, I got a body. If you don't have a body in this room today, you're dead. Right? We each have a body, right? Now catch this. It's so important to understand. But we are flesh. So for us to understand God or to know God, I needed someone like me or someone fleshly to reveal God to me. And that one is Jesus Christ. He is just like us. He, the Bible says he stripped himself of his glory and became like us. I, I like how Hebrew says it. It says, a body you have prepared for me. So in other words, God prepared this baby's body and in that baby's body, he put himself. That's what we call the incarnation. Almighty God took on flesh and dwelt among us. I, I believe it's John 1, 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Philippians 2, 7, and NLT says it this. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. Now, why is that important? What I want you to understand is what God did was take his nature, his character, his attributes, who he is, placed him inside this man, Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, so that God can now reveal himself to the human race. Well, I think that's a good thing. Because you know what? God's a spirit. I can't see God, but I can see Jesus Christ. And what I mean by that seeing Jesus Christ, I can see how he acted when he lived on this earth. And I can say, oh, that's what God 
is like. You got me? You, all right, let's go on. We have to understand that Jesus only did what the Father told him to do, revealing again his true nature. Here's what he said. Go over to John chapter 5, verse 19. Why am I doing this so delicate, delicately? Because, you know, I'm going to share in a moment with you two devotionals that I wrote for August. Um, you, you could have seen them online. August, oh, where are they? August 9th and 10th. And it was interesting that these two devotions, I'll read them to you, got more writing about it because people are so religiously brainwashed instead of Bible taught. Follow me. You'll, you'll see what I mean in a minute. But here we see how Jesus acted, right? Here he says, John 5, 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Are you catching that? So Jesus is saying, I don't do what I want to do. I do what the Father has showed me to do. Interesting. Okay. So then right there, I understand that if I look at the life of Jesus, I see the Father's heart. I'll give you a perfect example of that. You remember when, when the disciples came up to Jesus, they were rebuked. I, I guess, I, I think it was Samaria. I might be uh, missing, missing it there. And they said to Jesus, shall we call fire out of heaven like Elijah did? And Jesus said to them, you don't know what spirit you're speaking of. What does that show me? There is a little difference between that Old Testament and that New Testament. There, we have to understand that God deals with people in different dispensations. That dispensation was law. We're living under grace, brother and sisters. We're living under the dispensation of grace or what's called the church age. In this age, God is long-suffering, desiring that no man perish, no man go astray. Amen? In this dispensation, he goes out and he finds the one. In this dispensation, you got the prodigal son. You go into the Old Testament, yeah, you'll read some, some pretty wild stuff. But I'm not under the curse of the Old Testament. We're under the blessings of the covenant that Jesus Christ has with Almighty God. And this person here named Tom Fiola was smart enough to get in it. Anybody here smart enough to get in it? We got in. This isn't a covenant between God and Tom Fiola. This is a covenant between God and his son. And now we are in him. We are in Christ. So we get all the benefits of what Christ has done without the suffering and the shame that he went through on that cross. Amen. Verse 20. For the father loves the son and showed all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives life to them. Even so the son gives life to whom he will. He will. For the father judges no one. But he has committed judgment to the son. Watch this that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. Now, I'm going to make a statement, and this, this might be a little tough, but I'll explain why. In my estimation, religion is the worst thing on planet Earth, and religion has given God an extremely bad rap. I have tried to share the gospel with people, and they put that wall up immediately because they get into this statements like this. If God was a loving God, then why did he let cancer come on that person? If God was a loving God, then why did he let this happen? Why did that tornado go and, and cream that city? Why did that hurricane? Why, why, why? But they have never been taught that when Adam fell, Adam gave authority over to Satan. Satan is now the God, little G of this world. Jesus Christ himself said, the thief comes not but for to. 
I have come that you might have life in that more abundantly. It's so clear, so clear in our minds. But I'll show you how religion acts, amen? So on Tuesday, August 9th and August 10th, I wrote these couple of devotionals. Again, you can get these online. They're on our website. They're on Facebook. They're on uh, Twitter. They're, they're in different places. Here was the first one. It was called God's Bad Rap, part one. It was actually had about four parts to this, but I'm only going to give you two parts. I used the foundation scripture of John 14, 7. He who has seen me has seen the Father. You remember that? So I, I don't want to read that whole scripture. When we read the New Testament, I wrote, it shows us a different picture than what the world or religion tells us. In these verses, Philip asked Jesus a simple question, yet the answer should change the way we see God and help us to better understand where bad things come from us. Philip asked to see the Father that Jesus was always talking about. And then Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Well, by reading this, I can say that what Jesus did while he walked on the earth is the same things that the Father does. I never saw Jesus put sickness on a person, so I guess I would be correct in saying that God does not put sickness on people. Would you agree with me on that? All right. Yet so many people accuse God of doing this. I never saw Jesus make a storm, but I saw him quiet the storm. Yet even insurance companies say that that disaster was an act of God. Well, my question would be, what God? Then I wrote, let's hold that thought to tomorrow. Here was the next day. I used James 1.17 as the foundation. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of light with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And I wrote, yesterday we looked at the verse in John where Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. We brought out that the God our Heavenly Father is accused of doing many things that, according to what we see in the New Testament, do not line up with the way he acts. In this verse in James, it says that every good and perfect gift come from, come from God. Well, even I, with my little brain, can figure out that sickness, calamity is not good. It is like when people, they lose their homes through a tornado, a flood, or whatever natural disaster, people try to tell us that this was God's will, not according to what we read in our New Testament. When sickness invades our ranks, we need to remember that Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. I can never find one scripture of Jesus putting sickness on someone and saying, well, brother or sister, this is a good thing. And in and, and God's mysterious way, one day we're going to understand. No, we understand John 10.10. 10. Are you ready, guys? The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and that more abundantly. Our God is not a thief. John 10.10. 10. Can I get an amen? amen? He is the giver of life and good. But we have an adversary, the devil, that we have to fight and resist so that we can live this abundant life that, that God has promised us. Today, know who your enemy is and fight him with the sword of the spirit, no, with uh, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We as Christians need to know who our enemy is and know who we are. It's so important. We are children of God with all the privileges of God if we would believe it. Well, pastor, I know sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so and they were sick all their lives and they say that God taught them so much through their sickness. Brothers and sisters, I can learn something through anything in life, but do I need to go through something bad to learn that? No. Oh, well, you know, they were laid up in the hospital for three months and God spoke to their hearts. Well, if they would have gotten off their lazy butt and spent some time on their knees seeking God, they wouldn't need the time in the hospital. They could have time at home learning these things from God. We could use every excuse, guys. Listen, I don't need to stick my hand in a fire to know that if I stick my hand in a fire, I'm going to get burned. Diane's brother, Diane tells me this story. When she was young, her brother was so fascinated with the white part there of a fingernail. So he decided he wanted to learn what that was, so he ripped his fingernail out. Did he learn something? Yeah. 
Did he have to go through that pain to learn it? No. Do you understand what I'm trying to say when people bring this out? We can learn something from anything. Listen, if sickness invades me and I'm on my bed for a week, sure, I can take that time. I can listen to God. But I should be able to do that anytime, not just when sickness or something comes against me. Go over to Luke chapter 13. I want to show you this so clear from the word of God. Luke 13, 11. A pastor's sickness comes against. Sickness comes against all of us, guys. The Bible didn't say you're going to have just a fairy tale life. It says resist the sickness, resist the devil. It'll flee from you. The Bible says fight the good fight of faith. We're, you're still on planet Earth, guys. Until the Redeemer comes, we're going to keep on fighting. But what we got to do is get strong when it's not on us so that when it comes against us, we got something built in us to fight that thing. Amen? I'm telling you, you should watch my wife in the morning. I can, I can barely say hello to her. I go, hi, Diane. Hi, Tom. Give me a hug. We hug. We squeeze a little bit. And then she's off making her confession. She's got like 10 pages that she speaks over herself. She, I have seen her defeat cluster headaches like that. She said to me, this week has been such a stressful week with VBS and all that's going. She goes, Tom, I felt this headache starting to come right here. And I just said, ain't no way. I am not going to get a stress headache. I haven't had a stress headache for years and I'm going to resist this thing. And that thing went away. But it took fight. I'm telling you what I'm telling you. It took fight. This doesn't happen with, well, let me quote a scripture today. I'm not going to do it. Every day, day in, day out. Well, it's easier to take the aspirin. Absolutely. Take the aspirin. Not wrong. God gives us doctors. God gives us aspirins. But what happens if something invades us that an aspirin can't take care of. It's good to get strong when you got the strength to get strong. I've been fighting it for five years. I heard this on a tape the other day. It was so good. Inconsistency is power. It's that consistent life. Oh, I go to church when I feel like it. You'll never have power. Oh, I give when I feel like it. You'll never have the benefits of giving. Oh, I read the Bible when I feel like it. No, I have to read the Bible every day. Again, I'm not saying we got to read 20 chapters of the Bible. Take five minutes a day and read the Bible. And you'll see a change in your life. You'll see your mind get so peaceful. It takes work. Does it take work? Absolutely, it takes work. Plant a garden. See how much work it takes to plant that seed and bring a harvest. Amen? All right, here we go. Luke 13. We're almost done, guys. And behold, there was a woman that had a spirit of infirmity. It doesn't mean she was possessed with it. It means this sickness involved a spirit in her life, all right? And watch what it says. She had it for how long? 18 years. And some of you have been fighting things. Maybe that long, maybe longer. I, I know my wife fought what she fought for 20, 25 years. So these things aren't necessarily just a one-day type of thing, right? Watch what it says. She was bent over and could in no way raise herself. So this was her life. Her life was to constantly look at the dirt on the floor. Can you imagine that, guys? 18 years. I've had back aches. They hurt. Can you imagine this for 18 years? But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and he said, watch what he says, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. Great words. Would you say those are good words? How many would say that, man? If you're fighting something today, Jesus walked up to you and said, Brandy, you are loose of that. Diane, you are loose of that. Daniel, you are loose of that. Great words, right? Not to religion, but we'll, we'll get there. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. So picture the scene, 18 years. Jesus lays hands on her, heads up, she can look right into the Savior's face, right into his eyes. Boy, wouldn't you just be shouting and screaming and yelling and rejoicing with her? Come on, what if that was your mama? Was that your sister, somebody in your family? There they were. Now watch, watch. Verse 14. But the rulers of the synagogue, woo, 
answered with indignation. What did he just do? Heal the person that has been sick for 18 years that no one could heal? Oh, oh religion can just... Mm. Look what they got upset about. Watch. Because Jesus healed her on the Sabbath, on Saturday. Mm. And, he, and he said to the crowd, the ruler of the synagogue, this person, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, oh, you're right. Oh, okay. Look what Jesus did. You hypocrite. Man, people say, oh, Jesus was just loving. He was, but he was for, don't, 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 don't mess with him. Amen. You hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath day loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away? Now watch what he says. So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, underline that, she was a daughter of the covenant. Abraham was a covenant man. She was a daughter of the covenant. She was under the covenant. She had the blessings of the covenant. You can go to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and read all the blessings of the covenant. But then he makes this next statement, and it should prove to the church, I don't know how they miss it, once and for all, where good comes from and where bad comes from, whom Satan has bound, whom Satan has bound. Where does it say God has bound to? Nowhere. Think of it. 18 years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day. And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done. Is that something? People like us were, yeah, religion was crucify him. Whom Satan is bound. Satan is bound. I want to end with this story. It's going to be up on the screen. We're going to look at Jonah's life real quick. Jonah chapter 4 is what we're going to pick up. But you remember the story of Jonah. God tells Jonah, Jonah, I need you to go to Nineveh. Tell them unless they repent, judgment is coming. Jonah said, I'm not going to do it, God. So he runs away. Remember the whole story? He's on the ship. They toss him over the ship. A whale eats him. Oh, pastor. You really believe that? Do you know they have found people that have been inside whales still alive? They found the dog almost four days inside the ear pocket of a whale, and he was still alive afterwards. Listen, I'll believe God over anybody, guys. If God said it, you really believe that there was a universal flood one day? Man, it's amazing to me that they find fossils of clams and stuff on top of mountains, guys on top of mountains. Don't mess with God, you ignorant fool, you. Stick with what the Word of God says, amen? These people, oh, they know it all. They know it all. If you were reading your Word for You Today devotional last week, Bob Gass brought out so clear how you just take the moon out of the equation, just the moon, and the earth would start wobbling in its place. There'd be no more tide, so therefore water would become totally stagnant. If you just take the earth off its axis, one part would be so freezing, one part would be so hot, everything is so perfect because we serve a perfect God. And if you really want to believe in the Big Bang Theory that, you know, just one day, bam, and everything is, then go buy yourself a very expensive watch. Go out there and pay $20,000 for that watch. Come home, smash it, and throw it up in the air and say, come together. <laughs> and I guarantee you, it will not. It took a genius to put this all together. And that's my father, God. Amen. Is he your father too? So you're telling me you don't believe in the Big Bang Theory? I believe in the Big Bang Theory. I really do. Yep. God said. Ba-ba-boom. He said it, man. And this is, look at this. Amen. And once this curse is removed from planet Earth, the lion is going to lay with the lamb. They're going to take their spears and turn them into shears. It's just going to be beautiful. Don't miss it for anything. All right. So here we go. So in Jonah, you know, it goes out. So he gets inside a whale. Then he starts complaining about God. And watch what he complains about. Chapter four, verse one. This change of plan greatly upset Jonah and he became very angry. Interesting. What?
a change of plan that God didn't destroy or judge Nineveh. You know who this reminds me of? A bunch of Christians today. Why isn't God judging America? God should be judging America. I wrote a book and it said, God should be judging America. Mm. Listen, God is into mercy and grace. First Timothy chapter two, I exhort first of all, prayer, supplication, intercession, givings of thanks be made for all men, for kings and those that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. If you so want judgment to come on America, tell it to fall on your house, not mine. You still love me today? My Lord, oh, well, you know, if God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, he'd, he'd be unjust if he didn't just ju judge America. Listen, guys, Sodom and Gomorrah, law, us, grace. Now, after the rapture, I don't know what's going to happen on planet Earth, but I don't intend on being here. Amen? Amen? When, when Titus went in in, in 70 AD and, a, and attacked Jerusalem, guess what? History says that the church was taken out. They just all seemed to leave. They said that's what happened on 9-11. Many, why were there? They wanted 50,000 bags to put people's bodies in. And it ended up just a couple thousand. What happened? Testimonies started coming out. People saying, I heard something in me. Don't go to work today. Stay home today. Traffic jams. They couldn't get in today. What happened? God's grace. But we got to be listening. Amen. All right. So now, now Jonah, same thing. This change of plan greatly upset Jonah. He became very angry. Watch what he says. He complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a, come on, say it merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Wow! If we would just get that one verse in here. God doesn't want to destroy your husband, your wife, your children, your neighbors. And God wants to get them saved. <sighs> look at him, look at him. Oh, he's prophets. Verse three, just kill me now, Lord. <laughs> Remember Elijah? Just kill me now. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. I hate to say, that's a little arrogance here. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city. I, heard, I read that the east side was higher so he could look down. He made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. What was he waiting for? Judgment? Isn't it interesting that Abraham, a friend of God, when God said, I'm going to Sodom and Gomorrah because I heard grievous things about it, what did Abraham do? Here's God. Wait a minute. What if there's 50 righteous there? Would you destroy the righteous with the, with the sinners? That'd be wrong for, you, for the God of all things to destroy the righteous and the, the, the sinner. I won't destroy it if there's 50. How about 40? How about 30? How about 20? How about 10? There weren't even 10 righteous people there, but God still did not destroy the city until he got Abraham's nephew Lot out of there. People say, we're going to go through the tribulation. You go through the tribulation. I ain't going through the tribulation. My Bible says in Thessalonians, and we're teaching it on Wednesday night, that the wrath of God has passed over us once we're in Christ Jesus. This ain't the wrath of the church. It's the Jacob's sorrow. That's the wrath that's coming upon the world in Israel. Oh, well, you just read the book of Revelation and look what happens. Yeah, read up to Revelations chapter 4. Right there, it says, come up hither, hit her. The church is up there. You don't see the church anymore till we come down with Jesus Christ. Man, you want to stick around for the tribulation? Have fun. Ciao. Bye. <laughs> Twinkling of an eye, brother and sister. Twinkling of an eye. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and soon it spread broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm the next morning at dawn. The worm ate through the stem of the plant. 
so that it withered away. And as the sun drew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and he wished to die again. Death is certainly better than being a little hot. Can you, that's what he's saying here, right? Verse 9, then God said to Jonah, watch what God says. Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retort, retorted, even angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly, it died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in, its, living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? Church, America has over three, 300 plus million people plus animals. Shouldn't we be praying for America, for God's grace on this nation and not for God to judge this nation? Listen, once we're gone, we know this world's going to go wacky, but we're still the salt of the earth. We're still the light of the world. Listen, in closing, Jesus was always there for people. He was there for the drunk. He was there for the tax collector. He was there for the adulteress and the prostitute. He was there for the woman at the well that was married five times and is living for a guy. Didn't judge any of them. He brought compassion and love to each of them. That's what we ought to do. This is my message to you today. Don't give God a bad rap out there, church. When people say, well, God put this on me, say, no, he didn't. God loves you. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Thank you again so much for being here. I know we're right in the dead of summer here, but God is good. Amen? God is good. Next week, we finish up this God in Film series with our, with our last one. Father, we do bless you today, and thank you again that Jesus is Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness and your mercy. Thank you that your compassions, your mercies are new each morning. No matter how much I messed up today, you still love me. This morning as we wrap up, God is also a just God and he has made a plan that each, per each person can receive eternal life. Each person can be born again and that's through accepting Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. There is no other way to receive eternal life but through Jesus Christ. If you are here today and you have never made that decision, then I ask you to pray this prayer with me and we'll all pray it together to make it easy for you. But pray it from your heart Pray it because you mean it. Say this with me. My dear God in heaven, I believe today that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross, that he rose on the third day. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I thank you today for forgiving me of all my sins, I repent of them. I receive today your free gift of salvation, of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. No one looking. This has been a presentation of Christian Faith Fellowship Church located in Hardiston, New Jersey. If you have asked Jesus into your heart for the first time or are recommitting your life to Him, we would like to send you a free gift. This gift includes a Bible, daily devotional, and a CD explaining the life-changing decision you have made. We would also like to invite you to attend one of our weekly services. Our service times are Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. and Wednesday at 7 p.m. We are excited to offer a ministry for every age group, including an exciting children's ministry and a dynamic teen ministry. For more information, please visit www.cffchurch.org or call us at 973-209-7786. You can also download our app by searching for CFFC in the App Store or Droid Marketplace. Also be sure to check us out on Facebook for pictures, news, and upcoming events. Thanks for watching.